busy street. Hello and welcome to Views on the News. My name is Shalane. In today's programme we're discussing patriotism. Should we embrace it, chill out about it or worry about it? Joining us for this discussion and responding to our points and questions, we are delighted to have Dr Graham Barnfield, who is a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of East London and a member of World Rights Management Committee. Welcome, Graham, and thank you for joining us. To start off, Graham, do you believe that St George's Day should be celebrated as a national holiday and a way of promoting British patriotism? Do you think that the history of St George should be introduced in the national curriculum so people at least have an understanding on why it's a special day for English people? Or do you believe that a national holiday is unnecessary and divisive and could be potentially hijacked by xenophobes and racists? Personally, I think that St George's Day should be celebrated as a national holiday. I think it would be a great way for people from other nationalities to engage with the culture of where they live. As with other celebrations such as the Jubilee and the Royal Wedding, the nation was, in fact, united. I believe that not celebrating St George's Day because of the fear of a backlash is a great shame. And England shall be free. Hi Shalane, thanks for having me. On your question, I think the more national holidays the better, but that's strictly from the point of view of someone who likes holidays. What's missing from this discussion is what the educational content of such a day should be. That's if we assume holidays should have an educational purpose. Now, as a son of a Greek Christian and a martyr, uh, St George's real links to England are not especially strong. The main reason I'd go ahead with the holiday you suggest is partly because I think it would prove wrong all those people who expect English people to go on a xenophobic rampage at the slightest provocation. Hi Graham, I'm Katie and my questions are, do you think that one of the reasons for people's reluctance to be patriotic, particularly in European countries like the UK and Germany, is that we feel guilty for historical atrocities committed on behalf of the British Empire and the Nazi government? More importantly, is this feeling of guilt misplaced or justified? Secondly, in relation to the recent controversy over possible changes to the GCSE English Literature curriculum, is it right to place more emphasis on young people having a thorough understanding of British culture than any other cultures? Hello Katie, that's a complicated question. Britain and Germany have seen their guilt going in different directions in the post-war period. In the case of the British Empire, the amount of apologising has increased as we have moved further and further away from the real thing. So these days, it's quite common to read blood-curdling accounts of the Empire full of condemnation. For instance, with the recent anniversary of Winston Churchill's state funeral, BBC News coverage referred to Churchill's imperial record in an often hostile way, in a way that would have been unthinkable not too long ago. Germany, starting with the Bundes Republic, was once stuck with a version of national identity which stressed its lack of imperial ambitions and its new friendliness to its neighbours. Over time this was changing and some West Germans were growing impatient with it. It changed further still with the United Germany, but there's still some unease about how to manage it. Should Germans or Brits feel guilty? Not unless they were there at the time overseeing the atrocities before they became historical atrocities. People do have a responsibility to face the enemy at home in the here and now, but it's not something you can backdate simply to save your own conscience. On the second question, I'd say yes and no. There should be some priorities in teaching which, at one level, can help people to operate in society. I mean, even the rightly ridiculed Life in the UK British Citizenship Test recognises this, although no one can agree on what a useful set of questions would be. But at the other end of the spectrum, it's worth remembering that teaching parts of so-called British culture, like certain art and literature, uh, can also help to give GCSE students an insight into the human condition. Whatever we put on the curriculum, we should get away from the idea that the main reason for doing it is to glue society together. If students have a good humanistic education, they're well placed to make comparisons between different parts of the curriculum and different cultures too.
Appearing on American TV has certainly proved to be a hard test for British Prime Minister David Cameron. He failed to answer some key questions in a mock UK citizen exam set by the chat show host. A rural Britannia. Yeah. Uh, written by whom? I mean, it's, it's the iconic association with the British Empire. You're testing me there. Um. Hello, Graham. My name is Sophia. Let's turn our focus to the Scottish referendum. With the recent rejection of Scottish independence, do you feel regionalism has cooled down? Or has it provoked a resurgence of parochialism in the rest of Great Britain? For example, in Cornwall, the political campaign for self-government has been accentuated. Secondly, do you feel the yes-no divide will be problematic for future Scotland and for Great Britain in general? Finally, the structure of the modern nation-state could be to blame for restraining these regional movements. Do you think this concept should be rethought in order to accommodate these varied expressions of regional upheavals? Hi Sophia. We should remember that the Scottish people decided with a majority against independence. Oddly, regionalism there then heated up with a series of proposals for a watered-down version of Devo Max that nobody voted for. Regionalism will sometimes prosper when given an opportunity by the central authorities, but sometimes not. The pattern seems to be one of weak central authorities fueling regionalism through their own incoherence. The modern nation-state running out of steam means that regional identity, which is harmless enough by itself, such as the idea of the Geordie nation or something like that, can then pick up destructive momentum. South of the border, disenchantment with Westminster works in other ways, from abstention at the polls to voting for UKIP. So nationalism provides a rationale for rejecting Westminster, whereas a more confident, positive Westminster could have pushed back with greater conviction. English votes for English laws is a further symptom of Westminster's estrangement. After all, you wouldn't say English food for English stomachs. This version of the West Lothian question only makes sense because of the degraded state of Parliament and its degraded connection with the voters. Politicians are now moving out of the persuasion game and over to the side of just performing for their core supporters. Lastly, national identity can be progressive at certain moments in time. Think of the Republican ideal of the free-born Englishman, but for now it seems to have had its day. However, if you look at institutions like the European Union, which emphasise process over interests, you can't rule out a time when something sounding national, such as sovereignty, might have some positive potential. Hi Graham, I'm Jo. I moved to the UK just in time for the 2002 World Cup. And I was really taken back by this automatically assumed animosity that seemed to be expected of me as a German. Like, apparently I was the opponent. To me, coming from not only a left-wing, but a German left-wing background, even this harmless nationalism of flag-waving masses that you might expect during a football competition comes with a bitter aftertaste of attempts of world domination, of suppression of other people, of mass murders, etc. I also lived in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, I should say, for four years, and my impression there was that the strongly felt identity of being Irish was partly about the Celtic heritage, obviously, but also very much about being a people unjustly occupied and ultimately suppressed by the Brits. Now, this makes me wonder, is it possible to be patriotic without implicitly declaring some sense of superiority to another country or another people? Might that be cultural, economic or moral? Where is that line between pride of one's own heritage or origin and a chauvinistic attitude towards other people. Hi Joe. In a word, yes, it's possible to be patriotic without declaring your superiority to other people. Possible, but there could be better alternatives too. Historically, we can see a figure like Tom Paine as both patriotic and progressive, whether he was being an English Republican, an American revolutionary or a French parliamentarian. But some nation states, particularly imperial ones, have stressed the superiority. And at that time, cosmopolitan internationalism was the far superior response. I think today's situation is much trickier, as often nation states don't know what to do with themselves. Hi Graham, my name is Aaron Isaacs. Coming from America, I see a large push against immigration from the more conservative parties. 
In my opinion, one of their major concerns deals with the loss of cultural identity as the overall American identity shifts away from WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant identity, to multiculturalism. In the past few decades, there's been a growing animosity towards the Mexican population and recently a more ruthless distrust of the Muslim communities. Do you think an influx of immigrants challenges national identity? And if so, is it something to be feared? Hi Aaron. In response to your question, does immigration challenge national identity? Well, it depends. Some nations have made a point of saying that various influxes of immigrants are proof of the strength of national identity. Sometimes the United States has been a case in point. Others have responded to it as a big crisis and a challenge. The really dangerous situation is one where migrants are both policed through unequal treatment and at the same time the rest of the population is treated like a dangerous mob waiting to attack the new arrivals at the slightest provocation. Hi Graham, I'm Michelle. Graham, if you've experienced suffering in the country that you were born in or left that country too young to remember, how do you embrace patriotism in your new country? For example, if you're Mexican but didn't grow up in Mexico and grew up in America where you were influenced by American culture yet treated as a second-class citizen with limited rights and the threat of deportation, how do you determine where your patriotic allegiance lies? And do you have to? Hello, Michelle. The emphasis on birth and patriotism is typically part of the problem. Some types of patriotism have emphasized roots as a key factor, but if the process of creating a system of shared values isn't working, politics can end up falling back on something else. Look at the discussion of Francis Banelou's at the present time. People should always kick back against the unequal treatment of new arrivals, but there are different ways of arguing about this. Is discrimination inconsistent with national identity or a logical extension of it? Hi Graham, my name's Joanna and I'm interested in hearing your views on the relationship between patriotism and sport. It seemed that during the Olympics people were very happy to get behind Team GB and to fly the Union flag. However, when it comes to football, or more specifically to the St George's flag, there always seem to be big debates about the nature of patriotism. People seem more hesitant to fly the St George's flag. Do you think this is because people genuinely associate it with racism? Or is it simply that the St George's flag has gone out of fashion and is now seen as trashy, whereas the Union Jack seems to have become quite fashionable? Thanks for asking that, Joanna. The Team GB thing is interesting. Compared to the 1996 European Cup in football, when it was the St George's flag that was seen as acceptable and the Union flag seen as dodgy, nationalistic and linked to the far right. All of this points to an important theme that influences many of the questions. Because patriotism has been a way of getting large numbers of people on board and incorporated into society, then it coexisted with the fear of the loss of control. George Orwell tried to explain this by making a distinction between nationalism, bad, and patriotism, good, for example. And the chaff thing flags up literally the ambivalent nature of this relationship. Hi Graham, my name is Sabah. I come from a mixed background, being both Spanish and Lebanese. However, I never really lived in either country, and my family moved around quite a bit when I was growing up. This lifestyle meant never having a place to really call home or feel patriotically connected to. But it also meant that I became multicultural, which opened me up to the world in many ways. I did, however, come across a lot of people who were the complete opposite of me, who prided themselves on being patriots, and who knew little about the world outside their own country. They had little interest in expanding their international knowledge and experiences, as they believed that their country was the best, so there was no point. I am curious to know how patriotism affects intercultural relations in a globalized world. And is it possible to be both patriotic and multicultural? Well, Saba, it's important to compare the experience of different cultures, generally a good thing, with the problems posed by creating a policy of multiculturalism where people are treated as having fixed differences over and above their common humanity. In this respect, multiculturalism and its variations can often combine with patriotism and nationalism as strange bedfellows. Think of all the punditry today criticising Eastern European arrivals in the UK for their alleged racism. What you get is commentators plugging their superiority to the uncouth Serbs or Poles or Ukrainians. And that sounds a lot like nationalism to me. Hi Graham, my name's James. 
Do you think the rise in regionalism is in some part a reaction to the rise of the centralisation of governance? There have been widespread movements against the EU in many member states. Take our own UKIP, for example, and its supporters. Other continents have also looked to centralise at least some aspects of governance. In North America, there's a proposed currency union between Canada, America and Mexico, which would see the adoption of a single currency, the Amero, based on the Euro. It seems as the world shrinks due to modern technologies, a battle between centralisation and decentralisation of power is emerging. Do these opposing trends impact how we think about patriotism and nationalism? What your question shows, James, is the way that patriotism can mean almost anything. The term can have all manner of different concepts hiding beneath it. So some nation states make a virtue of their centralised character, which might or might not encourage regionalism. But if they start stumbling around, losing connections with the citizens, then the defining themes can spin off in all different directions. Hi Graham, I'm Marisa. Recently, it was revealed that there was an organised attempt by Islamists to co-opt schools in Birmingham and radicalise school children according to their beliefs and ideals. But doesn't this episode expose not so much an Islamic conspiracy, but the failure of British society to provide a positive account of itself, leading Parkview Educational Trust to reject the British cultural values and norms? Secondly, Graham, this Trojan horse operation has led to a debate of who we are and what it means to be British. The Prime Minister called for British values to be taught in British schools. But shouldn't we instead defend Western and universal values? Hi Marisa, great question. A small part of the Trojan horse story is that for years parents have been encouraged to get more and more involved in the running of schools. So when they do and the authorities don't like the results, it's easy to laugh at the authorities' misfortunes. But there is the bigger question, which is what is meant by British values? And the truth is that the Prime Minister has been useless at defining these with any conviction. One reason for this is that, for example, free speech is not actually a peculiarly British idea. It's potentially a universal one. But secondly, because UK politicians can be seen coming up with restrictions on free expression, they appear insincere and lacking in conviction. Hi Graham, I'm Vivita. Graham, following the rise of ISIS and their barbarity, some people have said, ah, but look at what the West itself has done, from slavery to the Holocaust. Even Obama has said something like this. This worries me. Surely we should condemn outright terrorist outfits like ISIS and not be afraid to argue some cultures and countries are superior regardless of their past. What do you think? Hi Vivita, nice to meet you. Um, on your question, there's a phrase from Irish politics, whataboutery, which means replying to one criticism, particularly to do with violence, by talking about something else similar. It gets particularly sickening, I think, in the face of ISIS. Someone mentioned British atrocities earlier on in the programme, but these mean that in no way should you suspend judgment about the so-called Islamic State. In fact, ISIS objectives, an almost limitlessly expanded caliphate, can mean that right now the patriots defending their borders against the IS are doing the right thing. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. If you would like to be involved in Views in the News, email us. Red, white and blue, what does it mean to you? Surely you're proud, shout it aloud, Britain's away.